All right, welcome back everyone. Thank you for your patience. Welcome back to the Tribute to Terrence series. Thank you all for being here and coming back for the last event of the series. Where are you all tuning in from? Let us know in the chat. See a lot of excitement. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Thank you to the mycelial web that connects us all. We are so excited to bring you this gift today. Wow, we have people from Nevada and Toronto, Houston, Los Angeles, New York, Oakland. Thank you all for tuning in around the world. It's really a gift to have you here. So today we're excited to bring you cultivating a relationship with sacred mushrooms. This is a gift from the community to the community. I'm Danielle Negrin. I'm the executive director of San Francisco Psychedelic Society. And this final event of the series is brought to you by the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy and the San Francisco Psychedelic Society. The McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy explores modern and traditional practices, ideas, and technologies that foster the understanding of nature and the cosmos. San Francisco Psychedelic Society is devoted to the exploration of entheogens, the expansion of consciousness, and the destigmatization of all drugs. We provide education, community, integration, and support. A quick housekeeping before we dive into this awesome day. Um, if you're new to Crowdcast, please utilize the chat bar to the right. Um, you can be there and um, ask questions and um, build relationships in the chat bar. And um, please share this event with your friends on mobile at the top. You can share at the top of the screen. If you're on desktop, you can share 15 second clips at the bottom left where it says clip moment. And submit your email to the mailing list. There is a green button right below me. And that way you can sign up to be notified about Micro Rising's updates and offerings about mushroom cultivation education. Um, please take the poll. We'd like to hear what kind of offering you'd like to see in the future. If you want to see more events like this, uh, let us know what you're interested in um, participating in. And today we are excited to bring you this final myco side chat um, to wrap up our month long tribute to Terrence McKenna. This free bonus event is a gift. Today we'll focus on the piece of work that is centered the McKenna brothers uh, the cement of the McKenna brothers in the history books, perhaps more than anything else, their publication landmark, the psilocybin, the magic mushroom growers guide. Today, we were joining Dennis McKenna as he opens up about some of the guiding vision, adventure, and unexpected impacts that come along with the guide of this humble yet culture shifting publication, which has since run through the world like mycelium and empowered the unknown masses to have direct access to magic mushroom and its visionary downloads. Dennis will be interviewed by Seth Warner of Myco Rising and the SF Psychedelic Society, who will follow up the conversation with a free mushroom cultivation class. I imagine everyone here is excited for the class as well. With decriminalization passing in Denver and Oakland and Santa Cruz, as well as over 100 cities taking the steps in that direction, there is a growing opportunity for people all over the world to begin developing their own relationship to these fungal teachers in the privacy of their own homes. This online class will highlight uncommon but extremely reliable method for mushroom cultivation that is the perfect fit for first-time growers from spore to harvest. Expect to learn more than just to grow mushrooms. Learn about building a sacred relationship with mushrooms, utilizing conscious cultivation as a way to more deeply receive their teachings. There will be a Q&A at the end of the talk as well as the end of the class. So be sure to ask your questions and there's an ask a question tab right below me. And you can also upvote on questions that you like or that you relate to. And questions will be answered based on relevancy and votes. So today the program is we're going to have about a 90 minute interview with Dennis and Seth and following directly after that there will be a mushroom cultivation class. So without further ado, welcome Seth Warner. Seth Thank you began, so much, Danielle. Seth began teaching about fungi in 2016 and is a lab facilitator with the Bay Area Applied Mycology at Countercultural Labs in Oakland. He later founded the Mycelial Mass Mushroom Meetup 
and then rebooted the San Francisco Psychedelic Society in 2017, where he's now the director of communications, which led to helping with the decriminalized nature Oakland initiative in 2019. For the past year, he's been teaching public and private mushroom cultivation classes under the name Mycorrhizing. Thank you, Danielle. And uh, thank you, Dennis, so much for joining us here today. Uh, yeah, you've obviously been a part of a lot in the scene. Um, everything from just the experiment, experiments at La Chirera through that crazy void, creating the Mushroom Cultivator's Guide and uh, a lot of work. And they've worked a lot with ayahuasca and different university settings and you've really brought a lot to light. And it sounds like you've done a lot of uh, really hard work in that university setting, something that is, uh, I'm sure you went up against a lot of friction and all that. And so thank you very much. Yes, thank, thanks, Seth. It's, it's lovely to be here again on this, uh, I guess this would be the fifth installment of this series, kind of an unexpected bonus, which I think is wonderful. I think this is a great way to end it, you know, because, uh, you know, we're talking about symbiosis and forming a relationship with mushrooms, uh, being the cultivators, the caretakers of mushrooms is so rewarding. You know, uh, and because the mushrooms respond they, with uh, the visionary reward. It's like the visionary reward at the end of an alchemical process. And it, it teaches you compassion and care and the reciprocity of symbiosis. So I'm just delighted to be here to, to talk about this. And I have to say, I'm going to miss doing this series. This is, you know, we've been doing this every weekend. And... Uh, you know, it's not been a burden. It's been a lot of fun. So I, I really appreciate your inviting me back for this and all the work that you and Danielle and our support team at the McKenna Academy have done to to bring this to the people. And the people obviously appreciate it. So that's that's really nice. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's been so much more than just these five events. It's constant mm -hmm. conversations and, yeah, really yeah. – weaving a rich uh, tapestry between ourselves. It's been really great and lovely opportunity. And uh, yeah, the McKenna Academy team has been so nice to work with. So thanks for that. And uh, yeah, I like what you're saying. I really like to say that, uh, you know, we can start with the gift of life to these mushrooms and then in return kind of receive what they have, what wisdom they have for us to kind of listen to, to download and uh, to have that reciprocity as opposed to like, hey, I want to get some mushrooms and they're going to do this for me, you know, like trying to dispel that mindset as much as we can. Well, you can, you can do that. Yeah, of course. And that's great. <laughs> but you can, but by growing them, you have to form a relationship, you know, and you learn a lot about basic human values like compassion and care, you know, and disappointment because a lot of people have some trouble, you know, in the, in the stages. These are, not that difficult to grow, but if you don't do it right, you can be frustrated. Uh, you're going to fix that today. You're, you're yeah, going to no way. 100%, no way can you right. fail with your method. So that's yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah, Cause it's very satisfying when it works. It's like having oh, a child or something. It is. Yeah, <laughs> that's like really like the gift of life. You really are like giving birth on some level. When you see those little mushrooms start to pop up, you kind of know what it means, especially if you use psilocybin before. And if you haven't, then it might be a, even like a little anxiety provoking, like, oh, my God, they're here. <laughs> <laughs> the invasion is complete. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, I've been studying all this uh, mycology, mushroom cultivation stuff. You know, I wouldn't really call myself a mycologist, just like kind of obsessed, kind of a nerd. And uh, I've been having so much fun sharing that knowledge. It wasn't really until maybe a year ago. Um, I was actually going to Botanical Dimensions, connecting with Kathleen Harrison, like there's that whole network there. Um, but like, that's kind of when I found out that, you know, Terrence McKenna, Dennis McKenna, that you guys were a part of this route that I was so much a part of. I had no idea. I thought Terrence McKenna was just kind of this philosophical, you know, he just talks a lot. That's what he does. But when I yeah. found out that, you know, he was good at that. that. <laughs> he was fantastic at that. And it yeah. was something that I as much deeply connected with, to be totally honest. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's so much value. I've met so many people. I've met a number of people that consider him a father figure. 
So that's obviously uh, a, a high compliment just from listening to him. Absolutely. But when I found out that you guys had worked together to create the first ever mushroom cultivation uh, guide, like right this there, is, that, is that the first edition? <laughs> That's the first edition. Oh my God. My only copy, as a matter of fact. I, wow. like the, I like the cover of the first edition much better than the second, but it's still out there. It's still in print. Would it be fair? Several printings, actually, and then the back is this. Nice. So if you ever run across the first edition, uh, buy it because it's probably worth something. Um, and then here, and the first edition, unlike subsequent editions, had a color insert. Full color. Huh. I don't know if you can see that very well. Maybe you pull it back a little bit. You might can't be able to see it very well camera. if I. There we go. If I don't show it. These photographs were made by Jeremy Bigwood, who uh, is listed as Irimaeus the Obscure. On uh, so this is this is the color insert. I yeah. <laughs> it's a collector's edition. Amazing. Oh, it really is. Yeah, it really is. Uh, it's rare. And uh, this particular edition is fragile. It's falling apart. Yeah, I see. It's got some a uh, little bit of water damage there too, huh? Yeah. That, maybe it's too close to the uh, to the mushroom grow. <laughs> maybe. Anyway, I, I wanted to show that, and I've got a couple other book, books I want to show you if it comes up in the conversation. But cool. wanted to be sure and show people that, and I just opened the book. What do we have here? Hmm. We have a little envelope. Undoubtedly has a spore print in it, and it says <laughs> La Charrera, eight nineteen eighty one. Do you need my uh, address? Or are you going to ship that over to my place? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably dead, Seth, to tell you the yeah, truth. Yeah. I doubt if they're viable. But what do we have? Oh, my God. All right. We've got Palenque, uh, 81083. This is, I don't know who's writing this is. I Were those included in the yeah. cultivation guide? Did you guys send it with a spore print? No. Well, my brother and, and his wife had a company called Syzygy for a long time that they sold spores and uh, no i just opened the book and there happened to be these Iquito strain santo tomas july uh 27th 1983 and ecuadorian strain 12 383 so you know it's great to know those are out there yeah yeah hard hard to say whether they're viable maybe i'll send them to you and you can try and you can see if they're viable. You're the man for the job. If yeah, anybody can yeah. do it, you can check it out. Well, that was a surprise. I haven't looked at this yeah. book for a long time. <laughs> Glad to see this uh, gleeful face of yours with this surprise. <laughs> yeah. Wow, what a great way to start off the interview. Um, <laughs> I mean, man, like it was just crazy to like, thanks for sharing that. And it's just been crazy to learn like, oh, wow, there's like such a deep root. And I think that it does, it, it goes unrecognized more or less that like what we know as modern mycology today is so much like, um, you know, it, it goes back to the McKenna brothers. It goes back to you and Terrence. And like, you know, maybe, well, we'll get into how, we'll get into why. And uh, maybe mm -hmm. you could go ahead and like set the scene because you didn't just go into it, be like, we're gonna make a guide, right? There was, there was a bit of a lead in and, uh, you know, I know it revolves around the La Charrera stuff. And, but yeah, feel free to. Well, yeah, so we went to La Charrera and uh, everybody knows that story. You know, we went looking for something else. We went looking, we, the reason we went to La Charrera was we were looking for this obscure Witoto hallucinogen or psychedelic called Ukuhe, which is made from Varola, which is one of the a genus of trees in the nutmeg family and, and uh, uh, the sap of varolas are some species are very high in tryptamines and uh, they're used as snuffs in different parts of the Amazon basin by different tribes, notably the Yanomami. But then we heard this, we ran across this paper by Schultes about an oral preparation involving varola, orally active pre preparation, and that's used by the Watoto and not very many other tribes knew about this. So 
we were very obsessed with DMT at the time, and uh, we wanted to get an orally active preparation uh, to spend more time in that dimension or whatever that place, you know, because the tryptamines are very short. You can't come back from the tryptamines with a lot, uh, you know, they're so impactful that you can just say, oh, my God, what was that? That was the most amazing thing. But as far as getting more noetic content, you can't spend enough time. Maybe some people can. So we wanted to access a more prolonged uh, uh, access to the DMT dimension. And we went to La Chirera for that reason, because that was that was the ancestral home of uh, Witoto. And when we got there, we got to this little mission village where about 200 uh, hectares around the mission had been cleared. They brought in Cebu cattle and these mushrooms were growing everywhere. It was a, the rainy season. It was very misty. And literally, you could not walk through the field without kicking over these clusters of carp. I mean, we didn't do that, but they were just everywhere. And we knew what they were. You know, we'd done our homework. We were not familiar with the uh, with the effects, uh, just minimally familiar. We'd had a, you know, we'd encountered them on the way to La Chirera, and we had one very light trip at a, our jumping off point for La Chirera. We thought, gee, these are these are great. These are wonderful. We did not really suspect the profundity, if you want to put it that way, of the dimensions and worlds that they opened up because, you know, light doses can be light and recreational and, and giggly and quite pleasant, you know. When we got to La Chirera, these mushrooms were everywhere. And although we were looking for this other thing, we thought, well, we can, we can play with these, essentially. We had a very cavalier sort of recreational attitude. We thought, well, we can play with these until the real secret shows up. And then they quickly made very clear that they were the real secret, you know, and they had a lot to teach us uh, and they proceeded to do that. And then that ended up in the experiment at La Chirera, you know, the, which, you know, people can read about, there were many crazy ideas, you know, that were, that came out of that, you know, but the one practical thing was that we brought these spores back, hoping to learn to grow them. And uh, after we left La Chirera, and after a couple of years, we did figure it out. And then that, and our, our motivation was as much to let other people access this dimension so that they could confirm that this really did open up the doorway to a very peculiar, very interesting dimension, or if not, that we were just batshit crazy and it was not something that other people, you know, experienced. Well, yeah. as it turned out, that was it was the former. You know, it does open uh, the doors to uh, a wondrous dimension, and so we wanted to share that. You know, uh, people with funny ideas love it when other people can validate them, and that was our motive. You know, and only only partly mercenary. I mean, it was it was more a desire to, uh, you know, give give access to this psychedelics to to people with a little ingenuity who could just buy the ingredients to make it happen from the grocery store, go home and fire up the pressure cooker and do it. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Um, I want to jump into a couple of like things. You know, you just you just expressed a really broad uh, set and setting. So I just wanted to ask you about a couple of things. Uh, one was, you know, you went down to meet the Watoto people. You know, did you ever connect with them and get that? Get um... We did, actually. We did finally connect with uh, uh, someone who was able to give us, uh, I think we had one sample finally, and it showed up. Didn't really connect with it until 10 years later when I went to Peru for to do my graduate work. And part of the graduate work was to do a comparison of the chemistry pharmacology of this Witoto preparation, Ukuhe, with ayahuasca. Because they were both orally active forms of DMT, but 
completely different botanical sources. And so that's what it was. And the reason I ended up working in Peru on this was that in the early part of the 20th century, the the most of the Watoto or many of them were le relocated south of the Putumayo, uh, forcibly relocated. They were basically enslaved to work in the rubber trade and that whole great amount of their culture got moved to this area around Paybus, which is a, a town maybe a day and a half downriver from Iquitos and then up the Rio Ampiacu, the so-called River of Poisons. There were Witoto uh, villages up there, Witoto, Bora, and Muinani. They're very closely related culturally. They're, and they all knew this substance as, as kind of as a memory, you know, having uh, been subjected to what you might call cultural trauma, you know, yeah. their cultural integrity was, was severely impacted by the slavery and the rubber trade. And thousands of people were killed. And, you know, it's, it's an American Holocaust that was never really discussed. And in these cultures, when that happens, one of the first things to go is plant knowledge, you know, and shamanic knowledge. So the people, our informants in, in, uh, on the Rio Yampiyaku were people who sort of remembered how to do it. You know, my mm -hmm. grandfather did it. My father did it. I kind of remember they were into this and that was, but the uh, informants were willing to take a crack at making the formulation uh, and they did. They made several samples for us and we bioassayed some and brought them back to the lab. And basically I did my thesis on that. And that, that was the occasion when I really, uh, you know, going from Iquitos to Pabas, that about four weeks uh, part of my work there, I traveled with Wade Davis from Iquitos. And that was really the uh, the first time in my life that I ever uh, spent time with him and got to know him well. You know, I had uh, run into him a couple times before, but he was there. So that's that's the that's the thread of of that story. OK. Um, well, I also just want to like focus a little bit more on the, the Watoto people. Um, sure. What was their relationship to the last Cubensis that you'd found? I mean, if you're saying it was growing everywhere and they had no connection? It was growing everywhere in the pastures, right? And the pasture was not something you encountered much in this. We were in deep, deep okay. Amazonian forest. The only reason there was a pasture there was because of this mission this capuchin mission, then they cleared the, the forest and brought in these cattle. So as a result, it, the, the mushrooms were not part of the Witoto tradition at all, you know, as far as we knew. I mean, we, they didn't seem to be interested in it. We didn't really interface with them that much, but, uh, you know, they don't have a tradition of use of these things, you know, because like, their usual environment is a deep forest environment. It just happens that there was this mission, which was also a, a school, right? That was the thing. There was, they, they, they sent their kids to school to this mission. And uh, the parents, I guess, would come and bring the kids and then drop them off and then go back, uh, you know, and then the kids would be in you know, not imprisoned exactly, but basically in these mission schools yeah. to, uh, you know, get religious indoctrination and all this and basically have their cultural, cultural, uh, cultural heritage undermined and, and ridiculed and, and, you know, what happens when, when the missionaries come in, you know, and, and often the first agenda is to destroy the shamanic traditions and the plant knowledge traditions. So when we got to to the Rio Ampiaca, we were we were dealing with a you know a severely decimated, impacted uh, uh, set of indigenous knowledge. You know, but they knew enough. So we we didn't see any sign that the Wachoto were interested in it, except that when we were hanging out in the pastures, eating mushrooms and acting crazy, you know, as people tend to do, 
I will say that the Watoto children were very interested in what we were doing. And I don't know, we probably further contributed to the erosion of their traditions. I don't know if they were eating them. Yeah. You know, after we understand. passed through, but I think it's uh, I think it's possible that a few of them may have nibbled on it after they saw us doing it, you know, I mean, these crazy gringos and yeah. You know, so, yeah, hopefully you didn't, uh, you know, negatively impact too many lives. Who knows? Maybe it's a positive influence if they, uh, if they got out maybe. of control there. Um, yeah. You don't know. That's the thing. You don't, you really don't know. No, no. But yeah. So another thing you said that you, you had done your homework. So, I mean, that didn't have anything to do with reading local traditions, but was there a lot of information available at that time? Like, did you go into the space knowing that you'd encounter the Cubensis down there or? No, no, we really didn't know. That's not what we were looking for. Uh, but we did our homework in, in the sense that we collected a lot of reprints, uh, ethnobotanical reprints. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, there, there was a, a uh, you know, uh, uh, I guess you could call it a house organ, a house publication put out by the called the Harvard Botanical Museum leaflets. Mm -hmm. And Schultes was the director of the Harvard Botanical Museum. So he had his own printing press in the basement and he would, you know, crank out these things. That's how we found out about the Ukuhe. That was a paper that he published in that, which we followed a lot. And we collected many other reprints. I mean, we had a, we thought it was a big collection. It was basically a small accordion file of a few prized reprints, but we had, we had, uh, articles about the Psilocybes, pictures of the Cubensis and so on. So we knew what these were. We had no real experience with them before. And then of course, when we got to Colombia, you know, there were hippies down there even at that time. And uh, okay. so we ran into people that they'd not been to La Chirera, but it grew other places like uh, San Martin was a popular hippie uh, destination and there were mushrooms there. So then we heard through the grapevine that these mushrooms were out there, you know, and and and, and hoped to uh, encounter them, but that wasn't really what our agenda, you know. We we, but that's that's the way it went. Cool. So like you got. So you kind of encountered it. That's amazing to hear that Schultes was kind of this person. You're kind of standing on his shoulders there. And I love the idea that he had this, I don't know, I'm almost imagining this like clandestine printing press pumping out information to all <laughs> these, uh, you know, Ivy League students, poisoning their minds at a time where these are controlled substances. Is that how you felt about it? No, not really. I mean, it, it, it was a legitimate publication. Okay, you know, I mean, I mean, it, and and it public. He published about lots of things besides psychoactive plants. He was, you know, I mean, what he did was subversive. You know, in a way, because it got this forbidden information out to people. But he was anything but subversive. I mean, he was very conservative. You know, but in this kind of Harvard, uh, Boston Brahmin kind of persona, you know, I mean, I mean, the uh, stories about him are lots of interesting stories. I mean, he, he, in every presidential election, he would vote for the Queen of England. You know, that's how <laughs> conservative he was, and not to say eccentric. But, you know, you talk about standing on the shoulders of, of Schultes, I would say definitely so. And really, almost every researcher in this field of, in, you know, psychedelic ethnobotany, I would say, owes a debt to Richard Schultes. You know, he was an inspiration for sure. I mean, Wade Davis actually uh, was able to work under him. And uh, I made a pilgrimage to Harvard in 1974 to visit Schultes. And I wanted to work under him too. I wanted to get into the graduate program. And he was very receptive, very kind. He, I mean, I, I took this uh, back in the day in 1974, you could buy a Greyhound bus ticket, $60 for 60 days. And you could go as far as you could go, as long as you did it within 60 days. So I got on that bloody bus 
and I actually left Berkeley. I went first to Louisiana, where I happened to have some friends uh, living in Hammond, Louisiana, running a, uh, a hippie leather shop, and they actually lived in a you know, on a ranch or a farm, I guess, which had psilocybin mushrooms. So I went there to partake of those, and then I continued on, ended up at Harvard, and Schultes was uh, very... Uh, you know, very receptive. But in the end, I didn't get into Harvard. He was willing to have me, but the uh, graduate committee was not convinced, shall we say. And uh, so as it turned out, that was kind of a blessing in disguise because I ended up going to UBC instead and working with Neil Towers, who is a, also well-known, not as well-known as Schultes, but he's known as a phytochemist. And... Uh, so I got a whole, uh, uh, you know, side to my education about plant chemistry that I would not have had if I'd stayed with Schultes. So and was UBC where you did some work with the, the mushrooms as well? Yes. Initially, I did work with, uh, with mushrooms at UBC. I was completing my graduate, uh, my master's degree at the University of Hawaii. And this was like 1979. And uh, uh, Neil was a good friend of my supervisor in Hawaii, Sandy Siegel. And Sandy was another amazing mentor. And uh, uh, Neil would come out to Hawaii and uh, to visit. I think his daughter was living out there at that time. So he would come out, visit Sandy, and they used to do things together, projects together. And Sandy, being the kind of guy he was, whenever a dignitary or some important professor came into town, he would invite all the graduate students up to his house. We'd sit around, have beer and pizza, and, and shoot the breeze, you know, with these people. And uh, so when Neil came to town, we, we did that. And in the course of the conversation, Neil said, you know, I've had this uh, master student, this young Asian woman working on psilocybe and, and looking at the characterizing the pathway of biosynthesis. She was trying to look at this enzyme that removes the phosphoryl group off psilocybin and then characterize that. And he said, I, I wish she, you know, she's not getting very far with it. I wish she was getting further. And I, I practically leapt out of my chair and I said, well, Neil, uh, Dr. Towers rather, I said, Dr. Towers, trying to conceal my excitement, but I said, hmm, well, I've, I've had an interest in these philosophies for a long time. Uh, maybe you would consider taking me on as a graduate student to tackle this problem. And he said, yeah, maybe so. So then correspondence ensued, you know, by letter, of course, these days. And eventually I got into UBC and my project was to work on psilocybes, characterize the enzymes of the biosynthesis and the uh, genetic regulation of the biosynthesis, right? So it was the first year was devoted to that. And it was a great time because I, I, you know, we had, I had a growth chamber full of fruiting carpophores of Psilocybe cubensis down in the basement of the biology building. Now, of course, none of that was ever diverted to anything, heaven forbid, right? But we, uh, yeah, and if you believe that, I have a bridge to sell you, but uh, <laughs> it was a good, it was a good time, and I learned a lot, and I was learning chemistry and, and uh, pharmacognosy and all that. But I was having a hell of a time with fungal genetics, which is just a bear, yeah. you know, very complicated, and I, it was, it was, I was failing fungal genetics. Let's, let's, yeah. let's just put it out there. I haven't done much better. Let's just, uh, I, I was getting frustrated, you know, and so it about, after about a, a year, Neil said, well, uh, also I'd had a bad bicycle accident uh, a month or so after I got to UBC, which had really set me back. But Neil said, well, you know, I went to him. I said, I'm just not feeling like I'm on top of things. And he said, well, I do have some extra money in my grant. Maybe you would prefer to go to Peru for a while. 
you know, that was the kind of re of supervisor he was. And I said, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, I would like to do that. So I shifted my focus to ayahuasca and ukuhe and the rest All is right. history. You know? Let me let's uh reel it in a little bit here, okay? Yeah, understand. It's a little far away. I would love to just keep like you know, there's so much content. You know, you've I, lived I'm a not, the, not the one for the short answers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. Um, well, yeah. So you know, we kind of covered. Well, now we covered like the later part of your life, talking about where you went with like psilocybe and how that actually led to the like the ayahuasca studies, going to Peru. <laughs> But, um, you know, how did you get there? And, like, how did you go from La Charrera to coming back to the States? Like, what was the process to get to the point where you guys were, like, cultivating mushrooms? I mean, I was under the impression until we spoke recently that you guys were maybe the first ones to do it. But you kind of enlightened me. You said that you're standing on some other shoulders. You're in a rich community. Like, what, what made it possible for you guys to actually make the guy? Well, yeah, I wouldn't say that we were exactly standing on people's shoulders. I would say there were two or three independent people working on this same problem. You know, one of them was uh, Paul Stamets, uh, and one of them was a guy named Bob Harris, uh, and then and then us, you know, and I don't know who else was working on it. We weren't really collaborating. We didn't really know, but... What made it possible for me was that, um, uh, well, so to go back to my visit to Schultes, right, at Harvard, I, I came back to Colorado after that visit because Schultes had said, uh, if you want to join my program, you need to get more taxonomy and you need to get more chemistry. So I ended up going to uh, Colorado State University um, which I'd already got my P, my my M, or my you know, wasn't masters of science, bachelors of science at Colorado University, but I went back to get these additional courses, and as it turned out, my best friend from high school happened to be running the greenhouse at uh, Colorado State University in the plant science department, so I had access to a tissue culture lab and all the equipment. And then I ran across this paper in Mycologia by a guy named uh, James and San Antonio, I believe it was. And I can I can double check that. Have I, you ever reached out to him before? I well, I never reached out to him. I I just read his paper, and it was it was basically a, this simple method for growing mushrooms on a on a substrate of sterilized rye. And so, do you know what it was for? What species it was intended for? It was it was for Agaricus spisporus. It was oh, just okay. for just for regular edible mushrooms. It was something for uh, uh, San Antonio JP, a laboratory method to obtain fruit from cased grain spawn of the cultivated mushroom Agaricus spisporus, Mycologia, Volume sixty three, page sixteen, and followed nineteen seventy one. So that, and it's in the book. So, so I thought, well, this looks pretty simple. And I had access to the autoclaves and everything. So we just, I just thought, well, let's give it a try. And we did, we grew the mushrooms on that and uh, it worked. Man, you, you know? make it sound so easy. You're like, yeah, we just like read this paper, made it happen. We had a lab. Like, you had all the pieces of well, I, I had all the access to what I needed, and it was it was pretty easy. I mean, we, shocking. Yeah. Only later did I learn that sometimes there are problems. But you know, we 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 got lucky. We got lucky, and a couple, uh, my my friend Larry, who ran the greenhouse, and another guy, Mike, um, who was uh during the tissue culture work you know help me do this and uh uh once once you do it i mean it's interesting when you cultivate them this way because it's a self-teaching process you know you you learn through your failures how to optimize the conditions i'm sure you're familiar with that so then it worked and then i shared that knowledge with terence and uh he started growing them in California and uh, we, uh, you know, and then, and then eventually that summer after I 
finished my work at CSU, I went out to Berkeley uh, because we were working on the uh, manuscript for the invisible landscape. And we were working on growing mushrooms. So we got the, uh, you know, got the idea, let's, let's put this book together. Let's put this, I mean, I, we thought of it as a book. It is a book, but it's more like a pamphlet, you know, but anyway, yeah. we, we published this book and, and that would be 1975, I think was when we ended up publishing it. And it was, yeah, 1976, it was and or press in Berkeley was the publisher. So can I ask you, uh, you know, you have some, uh, some creative names as uh, the authors of that book, Otios and Owen Eric. And oh, yeah. uh, I, first of all, I want to know, actually, were you guys doing that because you were scared of the law or something catching up to you? Was it purely symbolic? And what do they mean? A little bit of both, you know, a little bit of both. I mean, we thought that there might be some unwanted attention on what we were doing. So, yeah, we we chose to uh, use pseudonyms. And I always kind of regretted that because it means, I mean, in, in some ways people might say, you know, this is the McKenna brothers greatest achievement, right? <laughs> in terms of the impact it's had on, had on society. And yet we didn't, we didn't publish under our real names. And uh, OTOs uh, comes from two words, OTOs, 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 but it comes from the word OTOs, which means far away or far removed or unconnected. And uh, O-N Eric comes from the word oniric, which means dreams. O onirogens are substances that promote dreams. So o oniric or oniric cults or dream cults. So basically dreams from far away. Uh, which kind of fits with the idea that uh, mushrooms were extraterrestrial. You know, the, yeah. the forward to the grower's guide is maybe one of the best things that Terrence ever wrote, it's, you know, <laughs> and I won't, and, 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 and they're not extraterrestrial. I'm sorry, but uh, it's a romantic idea. Come you on. Know. Can't we believe? Well, you can believe whatever you want, but it, it helps if you believe something for which there's evidence. <laughs> Very scientific of you. Being Dennis. a scientist, that's that's kind of what I look for. There's, You can't, believe me, I've tried. You cannot make the case that psilocybin mushrooms are extraterrestrial, you know, and, and the reason is that they're just, we understand their phylogeny. We understand their evolution. We understand where they sit in the in the web of life. You know, they're definitely extra. They're definitely terrestrial. That doesn't mean that the message that they transmit is is not important. But it's a terrestrial message. They're terrestrial teachers, not extraterrestrial teachers. You know, and uh, um, so. So yeah. sorry to everybody yeah. that was just in it for the UFOs. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if I mean, I, I gave a talk a few years ago, and I I really tried to make the case that they were extraterrestrial. And as I got into the material, it became clear to me that you you just can't you just can't make that argument. You you have to you have to begin by postulating that tryptophan may have been a gene complex that was seeded into the biosphere, but that would have been about 3.8 billion years ago. You know, I mean, we're pretty clear that tryptophan was one of the oldest amino acids and tryptophan is found in every living thing on earth, you know, because it's, and the tryptophan is the precursor to psilocybin and all the tryptamines and all the many of these psychedelics, you know, these indole psychedelics basically come from tryptophan. Well, I think you've kind of like touched on, uh, I just <laughs> want to bring this up, like something that seems, you know, in this tribute to Terrence, also, you know, it, it ends up being a tribute to the McKenna brothers. There does seem to be something of a divergent sibling rivalry between you two, where it seems like you've gone so much for the science, the hard, uh, the hard evidence and all that, where Terrence was the opposite. He was going off way off into the deep end, out into interdimensional spaces, bringing back crazy ideas and inspiring people. I mean, how did how was that? Did that play into the creation of the guide? Did that play into your guys's um, you know well, it, 
it did later. It it didn't really play into the creation of the guide, you know, because this was just a how-to book, you know, it's it's cool. yeah. just a little manual. And of course, as you know, and and as you will be teaching us, this is this is you know, unless you like doing labor-intensive things, this isn't what you would use to grow mushrooms. There are much better, easier ways to do it now, but historically. And I wouldn't call it a, a sibling rivalry. You know, later we, when we were uh, writing the invisible landscape and other things, I mean, right. Terence was out there. He was the philosopher. He didn't really need to tie a lot of what he said to facts or to scientific consensus or anything like that. That, that, he didn't really feel like he had to justify what he was saying scientifically. You know, uh, he was, and I totally, I'm in sync with him on that. He was not a scientist. He was what I would call a natural philosopher, you know, and the thing that distinguishes natural philosophy from science, science grew out of natural philosophy, but it became reductive and uh, quantitative and and boring in some ways by its insistence on measurements and so on natural philosophy acknowledges that there are other ways of knowing you know and that are also legitimate and so that's why i named my academy the you know the uh, academy of uh, natural philosophy rather than natural science but my attraction to science you know really grew out of the the graduate work that I did uh, in, uh, you know, on ayahuasca and so on, or, or really maybe earlier than that. I, after we went to La Chirera and had these crazy experiences, uh, I wanted to get my feet on the ground. You know, Terence was utterly convinced that we had succeeded and that the sooner or later, the stone, the transcendental object at the end of time or whatever the hell it was, was going to show up. And he, he was convinced for years that the experiment had succeeded. I was not so convinced. And on the personal level, I was like, you know, I'm going to just kind of step back from all this craziness for a while. I want to get my feet on the ground. I went back to CU and finished my education, but I switched my studies from I was uh, studying uh, uh, basically comparative religions at that time and, and that sort of thing. But I switched, I continued to study anthropology, but I added in botany and chemistry and these various things, trying to create a program in ethnopharmacology. I mean, there was no no formal program in that, but I was trying to cobble together different different courses you know, to, to develop that. So in some ways, science was uh, something real I could cling to, you know, and, and still keep my hand in it, but also keep a hand in consensus reality. Yeah. Uh, you know, and Terrence, Terrence was ready to chuck science out the window, you know, and, and I, mean, I mean, we had conversations. He said, science can never explain what happened to us there. And my response was, well, don't be so sure, you know, don't throw, right. the, baby, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. In the first place, we're not scientists. You know? <laughs> so who are you to say? We, we thought we were scientists at the time, but we were deluded, you know. Right. Even we, the term, the experiment of La Chirera, it's Yeah, it's very I mean, we, we, and so one of the, you know, one of the, conclusions I sort of came to as a result of these conversations, which I told Terence, you can't dismiss science until you know how to do science. And then you understand how it works. So I'm going to go learn how to do science. And that's what led me into that more scientific track. But knowing the phenomenology of the psychedelic experience and then, uh, you know, and, and the, the what shamans go through and all that i always had that as a sort of foil against reductionism and materialism and all that and i think that's something that psychedelics you know really teach a person and ayahuasca and all these all these particularly you know a strong message i always get remember how little you know mm -hmm. you know 
And uh, it's a good thing to remind ourselves, and especially it's a good thing for scientists to remind themselves because yeah. there is a tendency to get arrogant when you're a scientist and think, oh, we have all this figured out. No, you have almost nothing figured out. That's my message, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, whatever, and what science has done, I, I mean, I acknowledge the accomplishments of science and the progress it's made to understand the cosmos and the world and all that. I mean, it's significant amount of, knowledge has been accumulated but it's a very small amount of knowledge compared to what is actually left to know you know um, and in other words uh, what we don't know will always exceed what we think we do know and i don't view this as a depressing thing i view it as an exciting thing oh it's yeah it's really riveting i mean i think that that's what can be so uh, upsetting about like the scientific paradigm at times it gets kind of thrown in your face it's on morning morning news shows and things like that oh this new update hey this saves calories or that and like you know it's just these really untested uh seems like so often these experiments things that are happening go untested they don't go down the line in advance it's it seems like it has an agenda all its own it can kind of become a religion so i really appreciate what you're saying that yeah. You know, uh yeah we got to be remember that it's it's just a very tiny percentage of any any right. knowledge and it it is treated often in our society like a religion like something that we should accept without question the scientists are saying it so it must be true and uh that's a misunderstanding of science because one of the things that distinguishes science from all other systems of knowledge is it's set up to test itself you know i mean the whole scientific endeavor is you construct hypotheses you construct which are nothing more than models or suppositions about the way something works but then you can go out and test those things you can ask questions of nature get answers back that either confirm or disconfirm what you thought you knew. Yeah. And if it confirms it, then great. Then you figure, and you never prove a theory. You always can say, based on what we know now, this theory appears to be valid. We may find out something next week that completely overturns it. And that's the exciting part of science. Of course, science tends to become rigid and science, especially institutional science. So scientists, especially if they have a lot invested in their success as scientists, are often reluctant to say, well, I was completely wrong. You know, I was totally on the wrong track. Some do, yeah. some do, but most don't because they have grants. They have, you know, they have to uphold their roles. But well, that's, but pure science, you know, yeah. is the search for truth. You know, if it's practically, if it's practiced purely, it's a search for truth. And it's a way to ask questions of nature and get answers back that you can validate or not. That's the whole point. And I think it's amazing that, you know, psilocybin for so many people, it offers this opportunity to step out into that mystical expanse where all of a sudden you realize Oh God, I don't know anything. I'm a tiny speck. It can go the other way as well. But I think, you know, most commonly in healthy people really have this like realization of how small we are, how big the system is that we're just like one tiny piece of. And, uh, you know, that kind of brings me back to the book. You know, how, how would you say that the impact, you know, bringing that experience, the psilocybin experience to people through this like cultivation process that you guys and then also all the subsequent like additions, like, uh, you know, alterations to the style, just completely different new things inspired by your original work. You know, have you seen that? Do you have a perspective on how that's maybe impacted the culture at large or uh, how it maybe has led to some of where we're at today? Yeah, I, I think it had to have an I think it had to have an influence that that was not our agenda, you know, at the time. <laughs> we just wanted to publish this book and let other people do it you know we didn't realize it would have the societal impact that it has that it has had uh you know we didn't know we were uh you know uh creating a psychedelic revolution in a certain way but once it got started 
you know, it, it just developed a momentum, a momentum of its own. And then of course, uh, so we gave people the tools and, and like, as my brother sometimes was said, well, all we did was create a method to get great dope out of Mason jars. In a certain way, that's true. And, uh, and then he was out there on the circuit talking about mushrooms and promoting the whole extraterrestrial origin hypothesis and the, the time wave and all that. So he kept the conversation going throughout the 80s and 90s uh, on a topic that I think the powers that be would rather nobody was talking about. And he, he kept insisting on talking about it. And then people were listening to that in part because he was such a great speaker and you know he could make people listen raptly to the to the craziest notions but then they also if they were growing mushrooms they had the tools to to uh you know experience for themselves a lot of what he was talking about so those two things i think sort of kept it in the conversation uh, cultural conversation long enough that, uh, uh, you know, eventually Rick Strassman did his work with DMT and then that began to force open the doors to actual clinical studies with psilocybin and all that. So science, uh, which before was afraid to touch these things, you know, it was taboo, right? It was too controversial for science to get into. Well, any time you have something like that, that's precisely where science should be looking at. Mm -hmm. You know, its whole point, the whole point of science is to push back the frontiers of knowledge, you know, to investigate the unknown. And, uh, and that's the true spirit of science. So, uh, you know, in, in that, in that sense, it was, it was a, it was a motivation. And then they, uh, and then they, you know, clinicians began to look into psilocybin and find that they were useful therapeutically. And even now in science, there's sort of the presupposition that there's nothing beyond that. You know, it's just, okay, this is a remarkable medicine that can help with a lot of mental disorders and so on. It is all that, but it's also a tool for understanding consciousness, you know, and exploring consciousness in the, in the psychonautic sense, you know, it's a universe within that we can, you know, uh, psilocybin is the ship that can take us there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I really appreciate that perspective of like, hey, this is a tool. And, uh, you know, you use, you guys use the term magic mushrooms, you know, it kind of implies, you know, magic. I mean, it implies that there's something really uh, out there to it. In my teachings, I've used the term sacred, you know, called the sacred mushroom. You know, and I do that to uh, kind of bring attention to this idea that we need to give it a certain sense of reverence. You know, we need to know how to use the tool. We need to know how to mm -hmm. use the hammer. And uh, do you have any uh, do you have any thoughts on like, you know, how psilocybin in that like base state of like neither good nor bad? Um, you know, so often we're hearing about what's good about it. Do you, you know, you're coming from a time and I look back, you know, in the past and I see things like, uh, these crazy conspiracy theories around like MK Ultra and like psychedelics and like being used for mind control. And I'll be honest, you know, personally, sometimes I get this, you know, feeling like, what am I a part of? Is there a, you know, is, why is this becoming so available all of a sudden? You know, I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on uh, per perhaps the dark side of uh, psychedelic use or psilocybin. Well, I think, I mean, I think there's a dark side to the uh, to the use of any technology you know um, growing mushrooms using mushrooms is basically a technology and i think the conversation there's a tendency to you know good and evil originates in the human heart good and evil is a reflection of human behavior there are many and in the drug conversation particularly, but also many conversations about other potentially impactful technologies like AI, like genetic engineering, like even atomic energy and these kinds of things, there's a tendency to say these things are evil. You know, no thing is evil. 
or good inherently. The evil or the good depends on how people use these things, the decisions that you make. So sure, there are lots of horrible ways, not helpful ways to use drugs. And there are lots of beneficial ways to use drugs. The drugs are the same drugs, no matter whether they're used for good or ill, it's the uses that people make of them that determines whether that's that's a beneficial, you know, ethical thing or a not ethical thing to do. What's always bothered me about so-called drug education, uh, you know, it's not education because it's always about the focus is on the drugs. These are bad. Don't use them. These are bad. No, people's choices about how they're going to relate to substances. So what we have to foster I think, again, like the work that you're doing, what we have to uh, foster in drug education, where formerly the, 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 you know, the message has always been, don't use drugs, drugs are bad. Well, that's like telling young people, don't have sex, you know? I mean, it's, it springs from a deep part of the human spirit. People are gonna do these things. We have an inherent impulse to experience altered states. You mm -hmm. know, it's just built into us. It's a function of our complex or hypertrophied brains that we like drugs. I mean, let's just get it out there. We yeah, like I'll, drugs. I'll say it right now, you know? I like drugs. Yeah, but let's be intelligent about how we choose to use them, when we choose to use them, what's appropriate and so on. So the message of these drug education programs in high schools should, you know, it's exactly the wrong message. The message should be that some, we're surrounded by drugs. We're totally immersed in a chemical ecology of psychoactive drugs, you know? So the message should be teach people how to use drugs. <laughs> you know, you teach them how not not to use them, or if they choose not to use them, then that's fine. They can make that choice. Most people are going to use drugs, even they may not even know that they're using drugs, you know. I mean, this extends to things like coffee and chocolate and all of these. These are psychoactive drugs. Yeah, you know? nutmeg. Yeah. yeah, nutmeg, you name it, all kinds of things. Many things we think of as food are also drugs. You know, so uh, so the thrust of drug education should be to teach people how to properly use drugs to maximize the benefit and minimize the harm. I mean, that's yeah, pretty simple. Yeah, well, there's certainly a lot of potential there for psilocybin, and yeah, yeah. Well, in connection with that, in interestingly, um, I just had a, I just did a podcast a couple of days ago with Dr. David Nutt who you may know of, he's the head of the Neuropsychopharmacology -psycho Research Unit at Imperial College London, director of their psychedelic research program. And he's come out with some interesting papers a few years ago, rating the relative safety of psychoactive drugs, you know, in terms of their impact on the individual, their impact on families, their impacts on societies. Wow. The most harmful, most dangerous drug is, what do you think? Alcohol. Alcohol. Alcohol is at the <laughs> top of the list. The least harmful, the safest, mushrooms. <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> yeah, I say. And this, this, this paper's out there. Look at it. In David Nutt, N-U-T-T. -T, do the search in PubMed. These are very interesting articles. Yeah. And he published this article. He was he was the drug, essentially the uh, in the UK the equivalent of being the drug czar, you know, and then in charge of their drug abuse programs for the for the British government. He published this paper. He was sacked. He was out of there. You know, wow, really? Yeah, he was fired for this. And he wow. basically said, "Fuck you." I don't care. And yeah. then he was able to, you know, get an even better job and continue his work. But yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, this is the thing. The powers that be do not like to have truth spoken to them. You know, we see this every day and he spoke truth to power and he paid the price. Yeah. Wow. That's a real lesson. Yeah. When it, uh, yeah, please. 
well, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, yeah, again, so, you know, we, we keep going out on these awesome tangents. Thank you for offering so many rich stories and themes. Um, you know, I kind of want to bring it back to like, after you guys published this book, you know, did you guys stay close to mycology? Were you ever teach like, you know, I teach classes, you know, I'm meeting people one on one. Were you guys ever doing anything like that? Were you working with mushrooms in your own right? Or, you know, were you just happy to get the book out there and then keep to yourselves? Well, we did, uh, you know, I, uh, we didn't really teach people how to grow mushrooms. You know, we figured that the the book would do that and, and yeah. it did. But we grew mushrooms for our own purposes and actually for, you know, our own, uh, you know, a mercenary benefit, I suppose you could say. And, you know, I think it's, I think it's all right to say this now. I've been criticized by my relatives for saying that, but it's pretty much in the public domain. I mean, the New York Times obituary for Terrence talks about how they were, you know, producing between 70 and 100 and 20 kilograms a week, you know, so that was a underground activity and, and uh, they did it. So what, you know, I mean, it's yeah. nothing to be ashamed of. It's nothing that people shouldn't be, uh, you know, should have to, I mean, it, it's known in the public domain, domain, you know, or, well, yeah, that's one way to stay in touch. Uh, I was, yeah, I was also just curious, you know, did you guys ever, you know, continue to advance your techniques? Or were you in kind of like a dialogue with other people like, you know, um, Professor or philosophy fanaticus, people like that that came up later? Or was it kind of like just behind you at a certain point? Did it, you know, did it well, guide your career or did it just kind of like create a foundation? I've created a foundation. I mean, uh, philosophy fanaticus and all these came later. Uh, when Terence got into it, he he didn't stick with the jar method because it's a very labor intensive thing. And eventually he found uh, other ways to do it that are, that are not so labor intensive and similar to what you do. I think, you know, the standard approach that didn't work for us initially. And we didn't, you know, we, I, I mean, he stuck with it. I, I didn't, I, I never went beyond just growing a few for, for myself, you know, cause I was, I was doing other things. I was doing my uh, my graduate work and then my postdoc work, and I didn't have time to do it. Yeah. Cool. So, well, uh, I'm. You know, we're getting kind of close to the end of our time here. We're going to jump in to do some uh, Q and A, but I have like just a couple more quick questions. Maybe maybe they're quick, maybe they're not. But uh, was there ever any like? really was there ever a big surprise to you whether it was like a singular moment or some sort of impact that you had had on other people totally uh kind of unannounced to yourself something like that comes to mind about you know how this book influenced culture or an individual well um yeah, I, I don't know if there was a, I don't know if there was a, uh, you know, eureka moment or a, an aha moment, but looking back uh, from the perspective of almost 40 years now, from the time we went to La Chirera, then we published the book and, yeah. and now here we are, you know, I look back and I am kind of surprised at the, uh, at the impact it's had on society. I mean, Terrence famously said once, he said, uh, what we're involved with is a symbiotic relationship with something that has disguised itself as an alien invasion so as not to alarm us, <laughs> right? And I think there's some truth to that. I mean, it's not an alien invasion. It's a terrestrial yeah. invasion. But it's a terrestrial invasion of our culture, our cultural content, uh, our, our cultural uh, consciousness or mindset by a messenger from Gaia. And that's how I think these mushrooms are. They are teachers. People learn from them. And I think the impact on society was that we, we published this little book, which any relatively intelligent 10th grade, 11th grade nerd with a little patience and ingenuity uh, could figure out, you know, it's a perfect science fair project, right? For yeah. 
people in that, and I think many, many people of that age, you know, they did many science fair projects, either privately, they were just hobbyists, or they actually did science fair projects and took them to, you know, science fairs. Terrence and I used to do projects for science fairs. We never did anything like this, but we did interesting <laughs> things at science fairs. They were great. Uh -oh. And, you know, I think, uh, I mean, I can imagine many conversations in suburban homes throughout America, you know, for their, about their bright, young, adolescent kids. Uh, you know, what's, what's, what's Johnny doing in the basement down there? You know, oh, I don't know, some project about growing mushrooms. I don't know. Well, isn't that sweet? <laughs> you know, that's, that's the way it happened. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. Thanks. Um, well, I, I don't have many other questions to ask. I'm sure I could come up with a bunch of stuff, but it, the we've covered a lot of great topics. Deep. There wasn't a shot fired and they've taken over and they have changed the, the cultural conversation, you know, at least in the West, they've, they've really been a catalyst, I think, to change people's attitude towards psychedelics in general and mushrooms in particular. Yeah, if you're looking at them as a catalyst, you know, and, and I think about this a lot, you know, if psilocybin's a catalyst, what's it catalyzing? You know, I mean, it definitely gives people a perspective of like, wow, like I'm connected to the earth. Like I see the earth all of a sudden more so. And and do you have a, a thought on like kind of what that leads to? Like, what's the next step? Like, what's the next step? You know, how do we see this unfolding? Well, as I say often in my talks, you know, both for mushrooms and, and uh, ayahuasca and these other things, they are messengers from Gaia and they're trying to, the message is wake up, you know, wake up you monkeys because you're wrecking this place. So it's a, it's a catalyst to wake up and become conscious of that. And then the yeah. corollary of that or the next step is, okay, wise up. Right now you have to, you woke up to the fact that we're wrecking this place and we're, we're, it's happening because we've lost our connection to nature and we've come our mind, the, particularly in the West, our mindset has been poisoned with the notion that nature exists to serve us, that we own it, that it's just there. It's it, for us to exploit and decimate and rape essentially and yeah. that's what we've been doing for way too long and now we're seeing the consequences of that and now nature is beginning to fight back and it's like you know these 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 plant messengers fungal fungal teachers if you will is one way for gaia which i do equate to the kind of the sentience of of the sentient community of species in the biosphere are trying to send the monkeys a message to wake up, you know, and that message is not getting, and, and re-understand, reassess our relationship to nature and change it. It seems that the message is not getting out fast enough. It's not getting out to enough people. So we're headed toward major ecological collapse within the next couple of decades. And that may be the, outside. So nature has now given us another gift, which is the coronavirus. And I really think it fits into the context of that. It's like, okay, you're not listening to the, to the plant teachers. So we're just going to make you, you know, send something that causes this out of control, technological, consumerist, polluting, culture to slow down, maybe not shut down completely, because that would be a disaster, but slow down, give people an opportunity to step back and reflect on that and mm -hmm. think about what changes do we need to make if we're lucky enough to get through this, then how is that going to change society? There'll be long-term changes where, I mean, we hope so. We hope that a message like this can find its way through society and a lot of people will listen and a lot of people with influence will listen because it has to change. It's not sustainable the way it is. Yes. And so the changes that we make now could avert 
much worse disasters downstream. I mean, we know, for example, I think from COVID, we we know, uh, I think it'd be face, safe to think that it looks like a lot of the 21st century is going to be about these pandemics, you know, yeah. and the next one could be much worse, you know, and, and it's not hard to imagine how that would play out. I mean, the COVID virus is as bad as it is, it's relatively benign, yeah. you know, and the, the internet still works. Uh, the economy has gone in the tank, but basically on the surface, people are, you know, the next one may be much worse. I mean, if you, if you get a, a virus like Ebola, for example, that is, that is, uh, you know, that's maybe transmitted through aerosols, then, we've got real problems Very real. and the impact will be huge. And the mechanisms that keep us informed, like the internet, those things are going to go down. And then, so we won't be able to know what's happening, you know, and uh, things can just go off track in a very serious way if something like that happens. You know, and I don't want to be the alarmist, but sometimes you have to you have to be realistic about that. There's still time. You know, we can shift our consciousness, and that's what these things, that's what the catalysis, that's what these are catalysts for, is to uh, help us shift our perspective. That's why psychedelics are useful therapeutically, and socially, and, and culturally, and biologically. They let you set step out of your reference frame look at it from a different perspective and say, well, what needs to change here in order to shift this situation? Man, thank you so much. Uh, you know, it's with heaviness in my heart, but that alarm is going off. It's been going off for me for years. And it's what really got me to decide to live my life as an experiment, to try new things, to dedicate yeah. time. And I think that, you know, anybody can do that as long as they're well, I shouldn't yeah. say, you know, it's always so easy, right? We all, a lot of us have these different tethers, but the work that you've done is amazing in the sense that you've allowed, you know, you kind of set the foundation for like hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people to access, probably millions of people at least, so like psilocybin. Yeah. And, uh, to at least have the opportunity to hear that message once, maybe again and again, maybe yeah. enough to change their life. I know for me, it's been a big impact. So, you know, from the bottom of my heart, man, thank you for for being, ringing the alarm. Thanks for ringing the bell. And, uh, you know, I know you well, probably know what you're getting yourself into, but. <laughs> thank, you, thank you for giving old people like me a chance to do this because you're the younger generation. You're the ones that basically we've handed you a bucket of shit, you know, and you are going to have to deal with it. So yeah. one, of the, one of the solutions is, well, what do you do with a bucket of shit? For one thing, you can grow mushrooms on it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a solution, you know. But I, I, I would just like to say, you know, uh, no doubt psilocybe mushrooms are part of the solution, but fungi in general are yeah. an important part of the solution. I just want to plug a book that has just come out, that's about to come out, uh, and by it's called Entangled Life, and it's how fungi wake uh, wake our worlds, change our minds, right. and shape our futures. It, it's reversed when I look at it. Yeah, that's it's, good. By, it's by Merlin Sheldrake, who is the the son of Rupert Sheldrake. We had him on last week. This is and this is all about fungi, and it's a it's a totally wonderful book. I, I want to promote it. I'm doing a podcast with him in a couple of weeks. I want this to get out out there because I've been reading it, and uh, it's not technical. It's it's just it's just a very significant book. I think it'll be out. You can order it on uh, Amazon. I think you can pre-order it on Amazon right now or other places. Yeah. But uh, Merlin and I are going to have a, a conversation about this. I think on the 28th of April. And uh, it won't be it won't be live, but it'll be uh, it'll be out there after we do that. And, and uh, people should write this down. It's it's just I so enjoyed it. It's just packed with great information about fungi. Well, 
Yeah, that's great. Thanks for dropping that. Um, yeah, it's been really exciting. <laughs> yeah, it's been really exciting. So I'm going to... Synthesizer. So, you know, it, it, the the uh, taxonomy and all that is harder to work out. You can get, you can find these things growing on horse dung and sometimes... And as most uh, psilocybe enthusiasts know, if you bruise it and it turns blue, that's a that's if you bruise the stem or whatever, it turns blue. That's a signature for psilocybin. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, so you can check the paniolus out, but they're not reliably um, psilocybian, if you want to put it that yeah, way. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, here's another question that maybe we could both answer. This is. What is the most influential paradigm shift you have embodied from using mushrooms? Maybe we could both answer this. The most influential paradigm shift? You know, yeah, take it with a grain of salt. What, how, what does it inspire? Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, it is this, this perception that we're out of sync with nature. I mean, that's that's the basic perception. The question is, how do we get back into harmony with nature? And there are lots of approaches to this, but there are lots of uh, lots of people influenced by this perspective and working on it. And, and but, the you know, something that persistently bothers me is how do you do this when you've got seven point five billion people? crawling all over the planet and consuming the resources and so on. So, you know, we're in this, in this situation where the, uh, you know, we're, it, it, I just don't know. I mean, this is part of the desperation and the, and the, you know, the, the worry that I have, how do you make this work for 7 billion people? Yeah. Uh, I don't know the answer, but there must, I think part of the answer is that we have to shift from from a, sort of a global perspective to actually a local perspective, more community oriented perspective. That's another place where growing mushrooms can really be important in that. You know, you can get just like you might have uh, you know, community gardens. This is the right idea. Local production, local self-reliance. Why not have a community mushroom garden where you grow many species of mushrooms for nutrition, for medicine, for spiritual purposes, and so on. You can, and you know, you, you're already doing this. You're developing a myco-oriented uh, community of people that are just totally committed to this. So you're a change maker, you're an important guy, you know, <laughs> and you're showing that you're showing a, a path forward. I think we need to refocus from the global thing. And again, coronavirus has done us a favor in that sense, in that people are not traveling now. The uh, airline industry is basically shut down. The hospital, you know, and the, the tourism, we, we can't just thoughtlessly, uh, you know, flit all over the world. It has a big carbon impact. Uh, and people are finding that, oh, we don't really have to do that. You know, we don't, uh, you know, we can do a lot this way we have to learn from each other and i think i think we need to shift the focus locally so that we have to get away from uh petroleum-based industrial agriculture you know monoculture and all of these things because these are polluting and they're not sustainable they're not natural you know and michael pollan long before he wrote about mushrooms was, was about psychedelics he was writing about these the omnivore's dilemma, the botany of desire, all of these things are really very worth reading mm -hmm. in the sense that he has this perspective and he understands something important, which is, which he discussed, which is, you know, uh, are we growing crops or are crops growing us? Have we domesticated plants or have plants domesticated us? Yeah, maybe it's not our fault, actually, Dennis. Maybe we should blame the plants. They did this to the world. 
No, that sorry, you can't slip out of it that way. <laughs> that's, we that's, a, that's a, the solution. They, but you know, but that is a good point because plants uh, are running the show, you know, and they. I get this message very strongly from my ayahuasca, and they're running the show because they've they mastered this neat trick of photosynthesis, which is basically what's sustaining life on Earth, you know, because you it's that what sequesters carbon out of the atmosphere using sunlight and produces oxygen as a byproduct. That's a pretty cool it's the craziest shit. biochemical <laughs> miracle, you know. Well, like, we need to invent new solar panels. It's like, wait, trees? They produce fruit and trees, oxygen? Trees, yeah, trees. Cool. How about <laughs> more trees yeah exactly i mean they're it's interesting they're they're trying to now uh you know create artificial analogs of photosynthesis yeah. more power to them more power to them let them do that because but the fact is a solution is number one stop burning down the rainforest you know which is uh releasing all this sequestered carbon back into the atmosphere as well as decimating the existing forest which is sequestering more carbon so that's you know i mean you don't have to be a genius to think well how about if we put the fires out let's stop there or start there and then and then see what you know see what we can do so emphasize local for emphasize sustainable agriculture permaculture and all that you know if you look at the amazon as an example, the Amazon is, people think of it as a trackless wilderness, you know, and there were, the reason there were few people in there, you know, when the, when the Spanish got there, fact is the Amazon supported between 10 and 30 million people sustainably before the Europeans got there. And it was a permaculture based, uh, culture that worked they had cities they actually had yeah. cities in the amazon yeah if did you read uh, america before the new absolutely i was just I gonna it. mention that's everybody should read Amazing. that book uh, i mean read all three of them but his is the latest and yeah it's amazing i mean his, his question is the evidence is pretty strong that there was an older civilization before this cometary impact that basically fragmented everything. Cometary impact is not up to dispute. This happened. You know, the geological, the scientific planetary, planetology people agree. There was a huge comet that impacted the Earth about 12,800 years ago. And uh, there were civilizations that existed before that and and probably they may have originated from the amazon it, it's a completely it's a mind-blowing book and it will change your whole perspective about human history and how ancient things really are i know yeah. graham very well i'm hoping to do a series of uh, uh seminars with him actually in the in the near future we, we've talked about doing a retreat but we can't do retreats so we're gonna do something virtual with him and so yeah awesome yeah he's a he's a fantastic writer he's really inspired me just just my thoughts he's just he's been present a lot yeah uh, I, so just to, to wrap up this question i also just mm -hmm. uh you you did a great job really touching on this question which is which was was an influential paradigm shift you've embodied from using mushrooms you're 40 some odd years into it so like that was a great global perspective and i would love to just touch on like my experience uh really quick, like being back in college, I remember having like a really low dose mushroom journey, maybe it was about two grams and it was by myself. And I was experienced like this agony of uh, really just like, I was just kind of like, I thought it was going to be fun. I thought it was going to help me get write this paper for school. It was going to help me be more creative. And <laughs> right, right. Immense agony it was just breaking in through the walls. And uh, I really had to look at what the hell is going on. And I just kind of had this deep realization, like I've been in boxes for some odd, like 18 years of my life, like preschool, first grade, this thing, every single day I get weekends and summers off. That's my free time. But just to see how regulated I was going to work, going to these different things. And uh, mm -hmm. that's where I got to snap into that bigger perspective. Like I've only been a student of man. I haven't been a student of nature in any way. 
I want to go out there and learn so much more. I want to see how people are trying to solve this uh, problem. And that led me to uh, go into study intentional communities through and studying. I was studying anthropology. So I went to intentional communities. I went on a bike tour and traveled and met a bunch of awesome change making kind of people that inspired the shit out of me. And I just want people to know that that's an option that, you know, if you feel inspired and you feel like you want to be this person, go out and meet other people that are like the ones mm -hmm. you want to be, you know, go try to find the places to get inspired to see, because you're not the first person, you know, you're not even close to the first person. There's hundreds of thousands, millions of people that feel the same way. There's a massive team of people that aren't fully connected, but I think internet like this, the way that we're connecting right now, Dennis, like this is really helping. It is one of the gifts of Corona um, to really see like where we can go. Um, but yeah, I just want people to remember that you are not alone in your desire to do good and change the world for the better. Like there's a lot of us and we need to work together. Yeah, and this technology is great. This is one of the benefits of, of the internet. You know, there are many downsides, but the potential of this uh, this technology to educate a lot of people is, is really staggering in some ways. And I hear you when you talk about your academic career, most of us spend time in one or another box, you know, as we grow up and get our education and then go into, uh, you know, the economy and so on. It's good that the psychedelics give us the tools to step out of that temporarily and maybe rethink it, you know, and there's value to academics, but and yeah. it's important to remember there are many ways to learn besides in a classroom, you know, and, and people should challenge themselves with these learning opportunities, you know, and, and travel and going places that are not, you know, I mean, now we have to be conscious about, uh, you know, how we travel, but, but it's useful to go to other cultures and then, and, and interface with people who have a completely different worldview than you do, you know, and, and they use a different language. They, they're, the world is different for them than it is for us. And it's good to share that information. And I tell people, uh, I get asked by young people a lot, how do I pursue a career in ethnopharmacology or ethnobotany or psychedelic research or, and I, I, you know, there are many paths to this, but I tell people my advice, figure out what puts fire in your belly, what you're excited about, and then go for it. Go for it. And don't worry too much about your success, your eventual financial success or prestige or all that. Pursue what you believe in, pursue what excites you. And it will be much more satisfying and all these other things will take care of themselves. You know, I mean, if you pursue it like that, like I never engaged in my career because I thought I would be successful. You know, that was not my goal. My goal was to look into things that I thought were interesting, you know, and uh, it's worked so far. <laughs> yeah. Technical difficulties. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, that that's the thing. People should just do. They should, you know, in, intuition is a good guide. You know, and you people, most people have an intuition about what they should be doing. A lot of times, they end up in situations where there's a lot of cognitive dif dissonance. Maybe they go to medical school and they're not enjoying medical school. And it was like, well, my parents wanted me to do this. I didn't want to become a doctor, you know. Well, step out of it. Rethink it, you know. Or you may say, I discovered medicine. It's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. But we, we have to empower ourselves to, to trust ourselves, basically, as we construct this story for ourselves you know you're creating a life you're creating your story and you have to trust yourself that you're and yeah. then check in with the psychedelics periodically so you can get a you can get a reality check you can say well uh, am i on the right track or maybe need to change direction they're good for that they're useful for that yeah, there's a, almost like a tragic irony that you wouldn't think that that uh, psychedelics are a good way to get a reality check, right? 
Like that's just not yeah. the common knowledge. That's not the common perspective. Well, the thing, yeah, it's it's true. It wouldn't it wouldn't be what your intuition is, but reality is uh, a malleable thing. Reality is not what it's cracked up to be. You know, we should remember that what we uh, that we're living in a model of reality. You know, that our brains create for ourselves. So uh, you know, it's not the real thing. The real thing may not even be knowable but we're in a model of reality and the nice thing about that is you can tweak the model you know uh, you can and you can step outside the model temporarily and say well need to make these changes which may just be a it may be a behavioral change or a dietary change or whatever or it may just be integrating the perspective that you have that that the mushrooms temporarily uh give you uh, this this idea that there is that we are inside a model reality and there's something outside of that. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you like touching on that because that's definitely something that also inspired my paradigm shift. Was that you know when I study anthropology, I realized that whoa, like magic exists for some people. You know these cr things that we consider superstition or whatever. You know they, they have varying degrees of reality based on the social agreements. And I just mm -hmm. realized that story is so much of uh, the core of what we're really good at. We're really good at creating stories, believing stories, creating meaning out of relatively uh, unmeaningful things. And uh, I just want to bring it back to this book that I was, I've been, I really love this book called Braiding Sweetgrass. Have you ever heard of that? Called what? Braiding Sweetgrass. It's by a woman. Uh, no, I don't think I have heard of it. Well, she's she, in, in one part of it, you know, they, they talk about, you know, ecolo it talks a lot about ecological record restoration. And uh, they also have this term restoration. And I just think that that's like a really beautiful uh, way, because I think a consciousness shift is as much a shift in how we the stories that we tell, the stories that we live by. Mm -hmm. So restoration, restoration and restoration. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and th this is why, I mean, we live inside a reality that we construct you know that our brains put together so we can make uh, sense of the world you know and a lot of what the brain does it filters things out you know and but and so that it can construct a coherent model that we can navigate in but within but then that reality exists within a larger cultural reality and a larger biological reality and a larger historical reality, you know? So I love the way the perspectives that Wade Davis brings to this because he talks about the ethnosphere, you know, and the ethnosphere is the layer of cultures and peoples that overlay that, you know, envelop the world. So it's like the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, the lithosphere. It's a, it's, part of the composition of the biosphere and he talks about and he talks about how uh you know there are seven thousand languages spoken in the world the vast majority of them are only spoken now by a few people who are old who are dying it's important to try to preserve that language and that not because every language represents a different worldview. Their reality is different than our reality just because we speak a different language. And these, these indigenous language is an incredible treasure that we have to, I mean, ideally we have to preserve the societies, but if that's not possible, and a lot of them are already gone, but it's important to try and preserve the societies, the, the, the cultural perspective. So the stories that they tell in these languages is it's a different reality and yet it's part of the human experience. So that's a very important thing, I think. And, you know, good for Wade that he articulates this. He's another guy, obviously, that people should read his stuff. I mean, he writes beautifully about this and, uh, you know, uh, he, he's another very influential person and, you know, has a good heart and, and good mind. And he's written 22 books. So there's plenty to, to choose from, you wow. know, one of the major ones I 
I think is One River, which is a story about the Amazon and Schultes and so on. And One River was an uh, important book. He's got another one out just about to come out called Magdalena, The River of Dreams. And uh, I can't wait to get into it. It's going to be really great. Everything he writes is good. Thank you. Thank you for the tip. Um, I could go ahead and ask you some more questions, but I feel like we're kind of getting there with our time. And I feel like that's a really good kind of place to end on is that, hey, like our perspective, our worldview that I think does need to change in a lot of cases, at least as a, I can only speak for the American perspective to some degree. But um, there are already so many worldviews out there that do hold the values that we need to learn more about these indigenous life ways, these, these different ways of being. And that I, I hope that we can continue to, or, you know, to more deeply embrace uh, those, those cultures, those traditions, whether or not we need to call it permaculture or whether or not we need to call it, you know, you know, and really bring indigenous ways. We just need solutions soon. So um, right. I think that, you know, just kind of that perspective of like, where do we go with this message from psilocybin? What are we catalyzed for is a great place to end. And I'll just ask, do you want to close? Do you, wanna, do you have any closing thoughts or anything you'd like to say? Well, I, you know. Uh, any pitch for the Academy, maybe? You, you could, we could give a pitch for the Academy, but we've done that a lot through this series. People can sure. look, look at the Academy and they can see the, the where the concept comes from because it's a it's it's a it, the academy is a virtual academy right now in some ways maybe it'll be a physical academy but it's a place for learning it's and it's a place it's a place where people can uh come to and learn to think for themselves you know a lot of times uh institutions educational and otherwise they're all about telling you what to think the academy is a place where you can get involved with and learn how to think you know and it's becoming a lost art it's becoming a lost skill because there are so many influences that are happy to say oh we have the answer here just come follow us whatever religion or philosophy or, or, you know, whatever you're pushing, we have all the answers. You don't have to think, just turn your mind off, you know, and then, you know, come follow, come join whatever we're pitching. That's the exact opposite of what you should be doing. Turn your mind on, open your way, your mind to other ways of knowing. And that's why these, uh, cross-cultural experiences and these other cultures are so important because there's real knowledge here you know we're not uh, just trying to uh, preserve these knowledge bases because we feel sorry for these cultures because because it's the right thing to do it is the right thing to do but it's important to remember they know stuff that we don't know you know and it's because they have this different knowledge base this different worldview and we can learn a lot from them and uh, so it's not that we're you know i mean i mean like wade was fond of uh, fond of saying you know these indigenous cultures are not failed versions of us you know they don't aspire to uh, to be like us we assume that they must because we think we're at the pinnacle of existence actually no they're fine they i'm fully Develop cultures and worldview. They're not trying to be like us. Maybe yeah. we should be trying to be more like them. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Okay. Thank you All right. so much, Thank you Dennis. So much. Thank I look you. Look forward to talking to you again. And okay. I'm sure everybody is super grateful. So. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Uh, I wish I could stick around for the mushroom class, but. I got to get back. I'm I'm buried and stuff all the time. So I'll I'll uh, wish yeah, you all sure well. A lot of good things. Yeah. yeah, get out there and grow those mushrooms. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dennis. Okay, and, uh, I'll be kicking you off then, and I'll be transitioning the rest of us. Thanks, man. It's been okay. such a pleasure. It's been really fun. Pleasure from this end too. Yeah. Thanks, Seth. Awesome. You're, you're, you're doing Thank a you. good, you're doing a good thing. 
Thanks. Keep I'm going to keep that sound bite. You're doing a good thing, so. Yeah. <laughs> Dennis <sure>. said so. <laughs> All right. Much love. Love to you.